thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is the Jinping Su College of Public Health Office of Practice and Research, and we're presenting our second uh, grand rounds uh, this week. Uh, we are extremely fortunate to have the the the, the wonderful uh, uh, Dr. Yendamola Akinso, um, and she's going to be speaking to us about building vaccine confidence and in her research and work that she's done. Um, and as many of you know, uh, she is an assistant professor um, in the in the uh, 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 Professor of Public Health at Nova uh, Southeastern, um, and also she is a global health specialist um, with. Uh, decade, more than a decade of work and experience in the field. Uh, she is one of our uh, graduates uh, that we are very proud of. And um, and we are looking forward to hearing from her today. Um, and I'll let, I'll uh, remind you of a couple of things. Um, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, and we will have a very brief announcement at the end of, the, uh, of this uh, Grand Rounds. We will first uh, have at the end of the presentation by Dr. Atkinson uh, a series uh, of open question and answer uh, that we know that uh, we will be enlightened with. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Atkinson. And again, a hearty welcome from, uh, from us here at, at Georgia Southern. Thank you so much, Dr. Telfair. It's uh, very good to see you again. Uh, thank you all for this invite. I feel so privileged and I'm very grateful. Um, as you already know, if some of you know me as um, Oinda Molakiso. I finished from um, Georgia Southern University, but I currently work with uh, work at uh, Nova Southeastern University at the Department of uh, Kiran Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine. and. Again, thank you for the invite. So today I will be talking about, you know, building vaccine confidence. Um, and I would be sharing my experience based on my field work um, back in Nigeria before I moved here. I also will be sharing um, also experience from the Ebola crisis. And then I hope, you know, we're able to see or learn one or two things and see if indeed SBCC, social behavioral um, communication is indeed an ideal approach to uh, you know, building vaccine confidence, uh, considering where we are at now with COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so I'm gonna start off with the overview, which is to talk about what SBCC is, especially for those who don't know what it is. You know, we're gonna do like a very detailed, uh, have a very detailed conversation about that, just so we give you the foundation of what SBCC is. And then we'll talk about why it's important or how important it is in public health programs. Uh, look at some successful SBCC programs and see if this is indeed the way to go for vaccine coverage globally. So as anyone ever, I know this is a diet session, but you know, you can always use your Zoom tools uh, to just give me a thumbs up or thumbs down, a yes or a no when I ask questions. I would like it to be that interactive. So the first question is, has anyone even ever heard of um, SBCC, have you heard anything about it? Social behavior change communication. Yes, no. Let's see what it says in the chat. No, someone saying, oh, someone saying yes, and I saying no. Okay, so that means you know you're in the right place. <laughs> Some people are genetically saying yes. Okay, that's good. Um, so yes, if you have heard about it, I'm sure you already have an idea of what it is. Um, but I like to think of, you know, I like to look at SBCC as that delicious turkey that I think it should be like a must have, you know, even if you're a vegetarian <laughs> during Thanksgiving. It's that meal that you just want to taste because it's Thanksgiving. And it's, uh, you know, for public health, in relation to public health, it's that approach you want to use when it comes to behavioral change, basically. So what is SBCC? It was previously, I'd say, formerly known as behavior change communication, and uh, now known as social and behavior change um, communication. This is a strategic, uh, or I'd say, a very important tool that is being used in public health, public health programs. It's a powerful and fundamental human, you know, it's, we use it for um, powerful and fundamental human interactions, especially communication. So, 
positively influence social dimensions of health. And so when I say that, I say, I say that to say that, you know, we use different communication approaches in SBCC to promote change in knowledge, attitude, norms, beliefs, and um, behaviors. Um, so BCC is often interchangeably used, you know, some people still call it BCC, behavior change communication, while some at the social behavior change communication, use that word, and we'll see the reason why. But, you know, either way, whatever word you use, um, but saying that with SBCC, we're able to coordinate messages, activities across various channels to reach multiple levels of society, and that includes individuals, the community services and policy. And for the students here, I'm sure you're already familiar with the social ecological model. We cannot talk about SBCC without recognizing some of the um, ground theories of behavior, or change, learning, and communication. So with SBCC, just a brief uh, background, you know, health is created through interplay of biology and social determinants that shape human interactions. And we know that these social determinants often include knowledge, attitude, norms, and cultural practices. And so therefore, you know, when we're looking at um, understanding human behavior um, and also trying to uh, implement interventions, we have to look at it from all the levels of the social ecological model, the individual level, the in interpersonal level, you, uh, you know, institution, and the community organization and policy and enabling environment. And at each of these uh, five levels of influence, there are factors that affect behavior in positive ways. And of course, there are factors that affect behavior in negative ways. So with effective SBCC intervention, interventions, we are able to aim to develop messages and activities that will influence all of these levels of social ecological model by maximizing the positive and minimizing the negative. So maximizing the, the facilitators and limiting um, the barriers. So why is SBCC important? We are in a time of crisis, as we know, we're in a pandemic. So when we think about it, we're saying, you know, this is during disease outbreaks and emergencies such as what we have going on right now, we need specific actions um, that are required to address certain situations affecting our communities. And this has to be done immediately for purpose of prevention, containment, and to control the sporadic spread of such emergencies, or I would say such diseases, sorry, so to speak, such diseases or the outbreak. So what SBCC does is that it helps to provide accurate, clear, relevant and timely information to the public on how to contain the emergency and protect themselves. And we'll see what you know, tools SBCC uses or we use for SBCC um, to provide such um, information. Also with SBCC, it helps to identify and address myths and misconceptions that may lead to detrimental practices. And we saw that in the case of the Ebola crisis. And we're gonna look at that shortly as we move on in this presentation. Then the SBCC strategies, or I'll say the approaches that SBCC employs helps to maintain public trust, okay? And so more things that we can achieve with SBCC is preparing communities for emergency response actions. It helps to reassure the public um, approaches or you know, programs that include SBCC approaches. We definitely have to incorporate um, you know, ways in which they can put information that can make public gain the trust of the public. And then also it helps to support communities and countries to recover and rebuild themselves after an emergency has occurred. So, so this, some of these are some of the SBCC tools. But before I go back, um, go, go into that, I know that most of us are familiar with the uh, Ebola outbreak, the tragic Ebola outbreak that happened. Um, one of the issues with the Ebola outbreak um, that happened in West Africa in 2014 was that there was lack of adequate and appropriate communication early on in the um, early on in the crisis, and this, you know, obviously fueled fear, panic. There was spread of misconceptions and rumors, and this contributed to the continuous spread of the diseases. So, in this context, if I would say communication goes beyond just delivering a simple message or just a slogan by saying, spread the word, not the disease. It also encompasses the full 
range of ways in which people individually and collectively can convey meaning among the powerful tools that are used, um, you know, that can be used to help uh, facilitate or to help um, start up with uh, SBCC program uh, mass media, community level activities, interpersonal communication, information and some communica communication technologies and of course new media. All of these can influence individual and collective behaviors that affect our health. So what again is the role of SBCC? Of course, it's simple and short, it's to engage the public, support them in making informed decisions about their risk and also encourage them to respond effectively um, to those at risk. So what SPCC does is, and we see it in the case of um, how the Ebola, uh, Ebola uh, outbreak, how they use SPCC, they use it to combat rumors and mis misinformation, to provide answers and what is currently known about the pathogens from trusted sources to calm the fears of the people. People were worried and they didn't have enough information and it was more of hearsay. So they used SPCC to calm fears with public health resources brought together stakeholders, community leaders, religious leaders together to fight um, this and give them some sense of ownership of the program. And then with SBCC, it helps to avoid stigma and discrimination against those inf infected. So when we look at um, key areas in SBCC, some of the key areas, or I would say some of the project um, activities that are implemented or strategies for, for a better word, is advocacy, um, coordination, community mobilization and actions, IEC materials, so message development and dissemination, capacity building, training of healthcare providers, training of community health extension workers, monitoring and evaluation. So let's look at some of the SBCC um, programs that have worked in, in this context, especially in times of public health um, you know, crisis. One is the Ebola um, crisis that happened again in 2014 that I mentioned. In Liberia, they had about seven, over 7,000 fatalities uh, as a result of Ebola. And this was because, again, the, the, the strategies that, was, that were used um, were not immediate. So they, uh, the medical interventions were not stemming the outbreak. They needed to, the, the Ministry of Health uh, and some international and national organizations NGOs had to come together to make sure that they design appropriate intervention to address this issue. And one of the things they did was to introduce SBCC to their implementation approach. And so they came up with messages, um, you know, very key messages on um, importance of hand washing, um, you know, how they can preventing messages. Um, they also came up with, they, they had outreach, outreaches, community mobilization efforts um, to be able to change behavior and abolish some of the traditional cultural, I would say long-standing cultural practices. Another thing was that communities needed timely and credible information. So they provided this information for the communities in handbills, in they changed it into their local languages to make sure that people were able to understand how dangerous the Ebola and deadly the Ebola virus um, works. And so I would say SBCC works. And why did I say that? Just in addition to what I've been saying, the right messages were provided for the people, not just in English or any other language, but in their own local languages. They had IEC materials, telling them how about you know, the importance of hand washing and all of that. They had social mobilization. They involved the community. They involved the religious leaders. They involved the, culture, um, the, the traditional rulers. And they provided key messages. Again, they did social mobilization and, of course, formative research. With the formative research, they had to do like uh, surveys that were conducted using text messages, using mobile phones. And they used that because they didn't have enough information at that time on how, how many was the prevalence, what's the incidence rate, have they done any surveillance, what's, how many people do we currently have, it? what's the source of this uh, um, uh, disease and all of that. They didn't have any data at the time. And this happened in Lofa County. So they had to quickly, you know, get mobilized um, their, 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 their Ministry of Health staff to um, also work with international organization, of course, and they had to conduct like a, a quick research or I would say formative assessment, which was to use mobile phones to send text messages to gather on the ground knowledge and perception of the virus among the communities because they needed that information to be able to design um, the intervention, to be able to develop uh, the program for them. And by so doing, they used the iTech 
I call it the high tech low touch method, and they kept doctors door surveyors away from potential um, exposure to virus. And within three days of the survey launch, about 1,000 men and women over the age of 15 completed the questionnaire by replying to the text from the geopo. Another thing they did was that this result actually was um, able to help SBCC professionals to design um, these interventions uh, programs that were designed to, to address um, the, the continuous spread of the virus and to provide uh, information to the people. There are other successful SBCC programs um, that I'm, where I'm aware of. Um, the, there's a social and behavior change for insecticide treated net. This was a five years um, global project based at the John Hopkins Center for Communication Program, and it was funded by the President's Malaria Initiative PMI. And this was, you know, just to increase um, the use of insecticide treated net. So they had to provide also. This was a community-based or community-level intervention that required training of community workers, also required, you know, just informing the, 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 the mothers and the children about the importance of sleeping under insecticide treatment. And of course, they did this by through the clinics and also providing this information during antenatal care, um, also training community health workers to go from house to house to provide this information. The one that I'm very familiar with, which is what I'm going to really do, talk on today, talk about today, is the one I was actively involved with. I was the health communication coordinator for the ESPIN project. This is called the Expanded Social Marketing Project in Nigeria. And so this was a social and behavioral, um, this was a social marketing project, yes, but it was a critical part of effective family planning program in Nigeria. Um, this was a project sponsored by the USAID and it was implemented by SFH, Society for Family Health. So it was a group of partners at, and I, I want you to pay attention to that because now we're talking about the collaborative effort and the effectiveness of that when we talk about SBCC. This was a project that was implemented by a group of partners. Um, although Society for Family Health, as you can see here, this is their logo, was the um, non-governmental organization that implemented the ESPIN program, but it was done in partnership with PSI, Population Service International, BBC Media Action, Association for Reproductive and Family Health. So what was this program about? Like I said, this was a five-year program, five years program between 2011 and 2016. And the, fo the focus of this project was to improve the health of women and their children by reducing the deaths and serious illness among mothers and children in Nigeria. And this was born by increasing the use of birth spacing and child survival um, products. And so they had four key areas that they focused on, ensuring that you know, family planning methods and products are available, accessible, and affordable. The second one was to improve knowledge, attitude, perception and practices of health, healthy behavior. Other one was to, the third um, goal was to, was to sustain collaborative part partnership with private health providers. And last but not the least was also to improve um, the capability of commercial private sector to locally manufacture health um, products. So this project was done um, in 22 priority states, 11 in the North and 11 in the South. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the ESPIN success was measured by its intermediate result, which works to achieve sustained family planning, maternal, neonatal, and child health methods and products. And of course, that included diarrhea disease prevention and treatment, malaria prevention and treatment, um, and nutrition. The program objectives were four, access to health products, behavioral change, BCC, which is what we're talking about today, uh, how we can change, um, improve knowledge, um, at to change attitude and perception and practice of healthy be to healthy behaviors, also collaborative partnership with private health care providers, and of course to support local businesses. So there was a mix of intervention. We had um, the project included community level intervention, community based distribution, uh, which of course involved training healthcare providers to go from house to house to actually um, also provide these services to women in hard to reach areas. 
We also used mass media, which is like radio, TV programs. So they had radio jingles, radio drama, and also their product sales and distribution, making sure that family planning products were not just affordable, but were available and accessible, especially to people who live in rural areas or I mean, you know, hard to reach areas and affordable for those with low income, like low income, um, you know, areas who live in low income areas. And then we train the PPMVC patent medicine vendors who are those who um, sell some of these family planning products. And so they had to be trained as well. Um, the, the major part of this, which is where, um, you know, I really want to, want to, I really want to focus on was the SBCC strategy that we used in this project. So it's, we use the IPC cycle model, which is called the interpersonal communication, where we would go to a community, you know, we would do like a, a needs assessment of that community, we would do a community map assessment to make sure, and then we would obviously go and speak to the primary healthcare centers, to the coordinators, the state ministry of health, especially in charge of the, the, the coordinator of the reproductive health programs, just to be sure that, look, this is a community that really needs um, this intervention. So we had to get all that information and we had two months of preparation because it, we had to implement in the next, you know, for the next six months. So it was a cycle. We would do a advocacy, site selection, mapping, recruit um, interpersonal communication agents, and these are community health workers, okay? They are community health workers, but they are not nurses or doctors. They have, they're just um, people who assist maybe at the clinics. So we can train them to provide health education because they have some sort of knowledge, like, you know, basic knowledge about health issues. And so we would train them and then make sure that, since that's their community, make sure that they're part of the project. So this project goes on for six months uh, where we expose community members to IPC messages on the use of modern methods of family planning, um, use of, um, you know, how to treat their children when they have malaria and diarrhea, cost-effective interventions, basically, and just making sure that, you know, they are aware, they have the information about, um, you know, malaria prevention and treatment, about, you know, the, the choices they can make when it comes to family planning. And I said it was a six month project. We aimed to correct myths and misconceptions about family planning, um, also about child survival. Uh, we also provided um, counseling through the healthcare providers and on family planning methods, side effects uh, of modern contraceptives. They talked about the lack of spousal support because a lot of women weren't getting that. Then of course, again, correct diarrhea prevention and treatment um, and making sure that people um, know with the women, especially women of reproductive age, well aware how to move forward when it comes to family planning and child survival issues. And so this is a picture of me talking to the men. We also organized like specialized sessions, talk, doing like going to the um, workshops to speak with men. It's called male involvement. So this was a specialized session where we had to target the men to provide support to their partners, to, to their wives. Um, so it was more or less like a sensitization of community members was doing it in special groups. So the men, um, the religious leaders, we would do special sessions of course, to improve male acceptance and cultural confidence, um, you know, and, of, uh, uh, and confidence in, in the family planning program. And so, um, you know, again, we reached out to the health, State Ministry of Health um, to support us with that. And, and of course, they did. Um, so we also used mass media and other media campaigns. So you will see dangle, danglers like this. When you go to a chemist, you will see um, posters on the walls. You would see everywhere you go to, there was an information about uh, the child spacing product. We collaborated with private sectors as well. Um, we continue to train our healthcare providers and the patent medicine vendors. Um, also, because this was a big project, there was a collaboration with the chi company that produces ORS. Uh, and zinc, which is our radiation therapy and zinc, to make it affordable so that people can have access to it and buy it and use it for their children um, when they have diarrhea. As of 2018, there was a 36% increase in contraceptive prevalence um, rate in some of the communities that we worked. I wouldn't say for all, because in the northern part of Nigeria, there were um, political unrest, and so some of the um, goals were not achieved in that area. 
So there are other successful SBCC programs as well that have to do with women and children, family planning. Um, in Liberia, there was the development of user-friendly pre-tested job aids to guide vaccinators in speaking with postpartum women about the availability of you know, same-day family planning. So this was more or less like an integrated service. If you come for a um, child welfare clinic or you come for your um, treatment, you can also get vaccines for your children and just provide that information. And so the same thing applies in Egypt. In, in Egypt, so they had um, also had a successful SBCC. I'm sorry, I'm trying to rush because of time. But um, so what are the best practices um, that we have seen in SBCC? Uh, we've seen community participation in program implementation. When we go there and do advocacy to the communities, we've seen how the, the traditional leaders are willing to listen and they're willing to learn and they're willing to support um, the project. Uh, we've seen how they, you know, they have even offered to give us health educators and say, look, these are my community members. They're good with health education. You can use them for your program. And they've been very supportive. There's capacity building of interpersonal communication agents, there's capacity building of healthcare providers. Don't forget that in these areas, there are um, um, rural areas where we, we have a lot of unskilled healthcare providers. So we have to think about the importance of continuous training for these healthcare providers. Um, there's been the monitoring and supervision of IPCAs. Um, also this community mobilization, uh, we also had to strengthen family planning practices through community-based distribution, distribution of product. We had the demand creation officers. We had sales representatives, detailing sessions and doing clinical presentations in places such as the pharmacy, the chemist, to encourage them to also have posters on their walls so that if, for instance, here in the US, if you go to um, the, 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 the pharmacy, you would see a poster talking about oh, maybe the COVID-19 vaccine and how important it is. So things like that were, were done in, for this project. We also had you know, the role of the community leaders, obviously fostering spousal support and also encouraging the men um, to support their spouses um, to take up family planning. We also had political support for this project with support from the government, um, especially I worked in Oyo State, so I had support from the Oyo State Ministry for Health of Health uh, in my project, and also because it was important for sustainability of this project. Um, so yes, we did have their support, and we this we also spoke did a, always had town hall meetings where we would talk to the government and encourage them to make sure that family planning um, supply was always um, available. Um, so. Again, I repeat, as SBCC works, you've seen how we have worked for the Ebola um, case, uh, I'd say the Ebola crisis, and again in family planning, to improve client's knowledge and perception of family planning, to increase the practice of recommended behaviors and use of services. SBCC has worked to improve health workers' knowledge, their perception and service delivery practices, and most importantly, to increase community support cultivating an enabling environment for family um, planning. So I say this to say that now that we have discussed in detail the importance of SBCC, I would like to think that SBCC can work for, um, you know, to help with vaccine confidence, um, acceptance, and of course, for vaccine coverage. I know that the settings are different, but um, I would sh share with you what's going on in uh, by what the New York State of Department is currently doing. And so I'm sure most of you must have heard some myths and misconceptions um, about the COVID-19. And if you can unmute and just say one or two, I'd really appreciate that before we go ahead. Anyone? Uh, some people claim that like, if you get the vaccine, it could mess up um, future like pregnancies or something. Yes, that's a very good, and I have that on my slide. So these are a few um, ones. Oh, okay, I didn't put that there. There are a few ones that I saw online, and I just thought to bring them here and share with you. So they said the vaccine just hasn't been out there long enough. People are concerned and saying there needs to be a longitudinal study. Uh, scientists and doctors don't really know the long-term effect of people getting the vaccine. So indeed, I'm hesitant. Um, there's also been concerns about you know people who say this might affect their you know 
people, someone has taken it. I know someone who took it uh, after having they lost their wife, you know, after having a baby, um, they had kidney issues, they had you know, hurting their head, was aching, and so on and so forth. There's another one that said, we've had conversations about it. We've talked about it. I do have some family that are inside the medical field as far as nursing, as far as doctor assistants and stuff like that, but they don't plan to get it. So those are some of the issues that we're seeing. Like even healthcare providers are saying, I'm sure there's some public health students or public health practitioners, so they are very, you know, it's okay to be hesitant. And I know that we're seeing that a lot. Although, you know, we're seeing how the FDA has, if, if the FDA um, advisory panel has recommended approval for these vaccines, people are started taking it. Um, a lot of times, you know, people are hesitant to take the vaccine uh, for so many reasons. And we're going to look at from research what some of the reasons are. But before we go ahead, there's a growing concern about the reticence to the, and rejection of COVID-19 vaccination. It, is, it has been established that racial and ethnic minority groups lack confidence in this vaccine, in the COVID-19 vaccines, which may lead to you know, refusal or delay or refusal to vaccinate. And so Black, Hispanic, and Native people are about four times more likely to be hospitalized and nearly three times more likely to die of COVID-19. Research, research from CDC also shows figures that show that you know, um, about 5.4% of Black people have received the first dose compared to the 60% who are white people. There's also a long history of being disrespected, mistreated, and violated by the government and healthcare professionals. But the, the themes that have been found to be the reason for vaccine excitation include parental concerns, of course, even they are concerned about themselves, they're concerned for their children because of the discomfort. Um, there's also weak interpersonal communication skills of healthcare providers. Um, we've always had issues of patient provider issue here, especially in the US, um, especially with people of color. And so there's, there needs to be some sort of training on interpersonal communication skills. There's perceived disease susceptibility. Um, also the government policies logic of having to take a second dose is a concern for some people. I'm like, why are they making us take a second dose of the vaccine? Anyway, there's also religious beliefs. There's the role of the media because immediately there's a negative story, it spreads fast. No thanks to social media. You know, it's, the social media information sometimes are wrong in most cases. Um, and so people lack trust again in the system. They lack trust in, they just lack trust about the vaccine because they just feel it's too early for something that has taken a lot of lives. Um, so vaccine rejectors have the potential to amplify myths and, and misconceptions, okay? And so, um, sorry. I can hear you. someone trying to say something. No, go ahead, please. Oh, all right. So um, I, I, I would say again, do you think that SBCC, based on everything I have said, you know, in addressing 19, um, in the way we have used it uh, for the Ebola crisis, SBCC has worked in family planning, especially because it, of, you know, countries that have uh, a lot of cultural practices and religious beliefs, they have used SBCC's approach to break um, barriers, I would say. And I think that, you know, if you ask me, I would say SBCC can be used to address myths and misconception, and of course, build vaccine confidence in our communities. And it's important to adopt some best practices from some of the SBCC programs that we have seen that have been used, um, you know, that we've seen in public health. Um, some other strategies that I feel can be used to build vaccine confidence Confidence is um, in looking at population level or policy level. Um, there's, there's need for transparency in policy making decisions and providing updated information regarding vaccines to the public and, of course, to healthcare providers. Then there's the patient provider relationship. Studies have shown the effectiveness in dialogue and the interpersonal communication that can occur between providers and, and, and patients. And for instance, you know, this frank and open discussions have a way of improving understanding of the COVID-19 vaccines, for instance. There's also a need for communication campaigns by engaging communities in dialogue through local opinion leaders or their peer groups, such as campaigns have the potential to build community support and advocacy um, for, 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 for the vaccine. Some campaigns have used celebrities to heighten awareness. We can see some of our people in, in, in government um, taking the vaccine um, and posting that online, 
you know, uh, the president, the vice president, everybody in authority taking and saying, look, I've taken it, you can see, and then creating awareness about vaccination preventable diseases is also very important. Very, very, um, the, the most important on my list for me is capacity strength. There's need to strengthen the capacity of health workers. One, one of the commissioner ways to train them periodically and upgrade their, their skills uh, by providing technology and new content. There's a very, very, um, you know, there's a, it, we can overemphasize the fact that people need to gain trust in the health system, in the research, in the public health research, in health system generally, and be able to say, look, I trust that this is okay. And by doing that, we, we cannot but have that dialogue, we cannot but have um, these conversations. Um, and so uh, I, I said I was going to talk about the New York uh, Department of Health. Uh, they have a pilot project. I have a friend who works there. And so I wasn't able to get much information to share with you guys today. But what I was able to pick from what she told me with our phone conversation is that they are having a pilot project phased distribution of the vaccine. And one of the top things on their list is partnership, coordination, and public outreach. So what the New York states, they recognize that coordination with local organization and community providers is essential to the safe and successful um, distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine and, and, and the admission of COVID-19 vaccines. And they have done, you know, the, the, the state is continuously conducting outreach efforts, um, focusing on reaching underserved, hard to reach, and vaccine hesitant population, as well as those you know, who are at risk for COVID-19 infections and poor outcomes. So I just put down a few things that she discussed with me. She said they're partnering with community partners, you know, local um, organizations, like I said. She said, you know, they have special immunization centers, the COVID vaccination hub, that they, are, they have recruited about 2,000 health workers or even, even if you, you're, you're just, uh, you don't necessarily have to be a nurse or a doctor, but you can provide health education. You know, they recruited those and they're training them. Um, they, they have community health workers um, as well. They book appointments for people who are in art to reach areas through the iPad. So I think they're doing a door to door. Um, they, they're also going to scale up for the door to door approach because they see a lot of elderly people don't even use iPad, <laughs> cannot tech savvy. So they have to use community, you know, health workers to go and reach um, this, especially the elderly. They are targeting minority groups like the Latinos and the Blacks in the community. Um, they also have weekends, um, um, they have uh, their open weekends. So they run the weekend clinic uh, for people to come take vaccines. Um, so like I said, these are some of the things they understand the context and cultural competence and issues going on and these are some of the strategies they're using um, to um, address the situation one of the other things they mentioned she mentioned to me was the vaccine hoarding and when she said that to me i found it really strange that there, 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 there's some people hoarding the vaccine she didn't give so much information on that but i guess you know we'll later find out i'm sure there's, there's there was a news recently of a doctor who was involved in that um, situation so in closing, what, what are my main messages for you today? I want you all to know that SBCC has a critical component to, you know, it, it's, a, it's a critical tool to be precise and has proven effective time and time over again in several health areas, such as increasing the use of family planning methods, preventing HIV and AIDS, reducing the spread of malaria and other infectious diseases and improving newborn and maternal health. So there's need for, for us to start considering SBCC as, as a very um, you know, important strategy to use to build vaccine confidence. Strong confidence in vaccine within the community would lead to more people getting vaccinated and this will lead to fewer COVID-19 illnesses, you know, hospitalizations and um, deaths. Thank you for listening. These are my references and do you have any questions? Okay, so we are open uh, for questions. Uh, for if you could either unmute your mic or put it in the chat, please. Can, can I ask a question quickly? Of course. Um, are you aware of like there's more than a thousand people died from those vaccinations for COVID nineteen? Well, I'm not aware of that. I'm just hearing this for the first 
Yeah, because I I can you can search it, and uh, okay. I don't know why the CDC not announcing those kind of cases. Okay. There already some uh, death and some been uh, hospitalized for reaction on those vaccines, but I'm, I'm not seeing the CDC is announcing any of these. I, I personally think that, you know, uh, again, I, I, I could see where you're coming from, Dr. Samawi, but the concern I usually have is like, what, what are these, what's the source of this information? And I, I, as a public health person, let me wear my public health cap, would of course uh, rely on, um, uh, on information from organizations like the World Health Organization and CDC um, to give me information about you know, um, vaccine reactions or even if there's been mortality and morbidity. And when I was doing my site, and just like you rightly said, I didn't find anything about that. But these are the kind of information that people hear and have become, of course, very hesitant to um, being accepting or wanting to even take the, the COVID-19. And I think they are projecting the positives more because like, there are people who are taking it who are not But then we also need to do a research and find out what is the cause of the reaction? Uh, what, what are the reasons? And that's if they are ready to talk about it. But we don't see some of those informations um, online or even on their website. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Please. Um, so I was kind of um, more of a broader question, but do you, you know, think as these things become more relevant and happen more often, you know, the spreading of these types of antiviral um, pathogens, do you think that uh, the public stigma towards vaccines will change over time? Or, or do you think there will always be people that, you know, or a big group of people that really don't like the idea of getting vaccinated? People have always frowned at the idea of vaccination anyway um, from time past. And we have seen that in several countries. And I'm always speaking, when I speak, I try to speak from a global health perspective because we have seen vaccine hesitancy or hesitation is, is not new. Um, we've seen that people are tired of, um, you know, taking vaccines for all this, whether it's viral or bacteria, whatever disease it is, people are like, look, we don't even want it. I know people who say for religious reasons we're not taking it. I come from a country where people are hesitant to vaccine. What polio eradication or uh, elimination has happened in so many countries, but I come from a country where we still have one or two cases. That's because people are not, they don't trust the, 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 that the vaccine is doing what it's supposed to do. They feel like, you know, because of the cases of uh, morbidity or disability or mortality that they have seen from people who have taken some vaccines. Um, they believe that this is the same that would occur, especially now that we're talking about COVID-19. And so when there's another outbreak, I'm sure people will just get tired, not just tired of the vaccine, tired of isolation, tired of quarantining, tired of lockdown. <laughs> so it's a whole like, you know, people are just gonna be tired of everything, but we can't, we can't, um, um, we, we all have to, look at it from the perspective like you know if we have to protect ourselves we have to promote prevention we also have to promote treatment um, as public health practitioners so i don't know if that answers your question but that's the way i see thank you yeah, thank you uh, so we do have a comment uh dr uh chopak foster you want me to read your comment or would you like to just state it please <laughs> sure um, uh, if you do a search COVID deaths, um, you will get information from the CDC and you can, you can do as, as the presentation suggested, um, vaccine hesitancy is not anything new. We have seen this in particular with respect to, um, the night, the, um, fudging of data that caused the 19, late 90s report on the role of vaccinations causing autism. In the United States, we have a huge anti-vaxxer movement. And of course, social media has exacerbated that as well. And there will be many people who choose not to take this vaccine in this country, um, regardless of the data. But I think it's a little bit um, too soon to say how many deaths have been reported because according to the reports, um, there's not necessarily the link 
that that there are related specifically to the vaccine. So what Dr. Akinzo said that to really dig deeper to find the underlying cause um, is important. Everybody okay. can have to make their own decision, but with respect to fear of death, um, you know, obviously we don't know right now if they're anecdotal or if they're specifically related to the vaccine or some other craziness. For example, people have gotten the vaccine and just the day before without knowing it were exposed to COVID. And so that has also caused a reaction that was potentially unexpected and not seen in the trials. Okay, thank you. Good, good public health practice um, in terms of investigating and then using cause and effect. Thank you. So the other question that you have is um, from a, 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 oh boy, I can't pronounce the last name, is, is L-A-A-L-A-W-O-D-E, last name, um, that says, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, please, how do you address situations where supposed gatekeepers and religious leaders deny the existence of COVID-19 uh, not to talk of taking the vaccine? That's the question. Oh, thank you for that question. And that person obviously knows better because this person is from Nigeria. Okay, uh, okay. Um, there, <laughs> um, so there's, um, there are um, situations where um, we, we, we've had religious leaders and, and of course, people who don't um, believe, or to really, just to be specific, religious leaders and traditional leaders who do not believe that there's anything called COVID-19, of course, because of their beliefs, again, strong, strong norms and, uh, and beliefs and perceptions and, and all of this play an important role. And how have we addressed this in the past with other programs, for instance, of them saying they don't want family planning product, um, services or of them saying they don't want immunization for their community. It's been dialogue. We, we, we have to keep speaking. We have to keep talking about it. There are different approaches to dialogue. You know, when, when we're speaking with people who have very adamant because of their religious beliefs, they also have to see statistics. They have to see the need to, see, to you know, we have to invite them for town hall meetings, invite them for health sessions, go to meet them in person sometimes, which is what I did when I was trying to convince one of my um, um, traditional religious leader is um, Islamic leader in uh, Nigeria. Um, I, I did know, I knew that he had already told his people not to listen to me, but I went um, with the state ministry of health and I went there considering the fact that I had to be culturally appropriate in my message. I made sure I, so I understood everything he, where he was coming from, but I was able to use key messages to address, um, you know, the myths and misconception he had had. And I had made him see the data, see what statistics is saying, um, on what the consequences of, you know, for instance, the consequences of not taking family planning uh, product, um, services, where you, your, your, your people, your community members start giving birth every nine months can lead to maternal mortality, for instance. So he saw the, he saw the, he saw the health indicators, he saw the, the, what research is saying. We're able to break it down to him in layman's language, in the language he understood. We used IEC materials, we came down to their level, and like I said, over time, Rome wasn't built in a day. Over time and persistence and consistency, he began to see things differently. For COVID-19, it's a lot going on right now. We have to start from somewhere. There's a lot of information out there that has made them believe that like, you see, this is not even, this is not something we're talking about. But a lot of them are seeing people drop dead right, left, right, and center. Uh, and they know that it's COVID-19. And, and I think a lot of them are beginning to, to start to think about it differently. Okay, thank you. So we have another question that says, um, do you think the term vaccination is misleading to the public? We have coined the term encouraging the public to get the flu shot. So what are your thoughts about this? Vaccination is vaccination. <laughs> I'm just thinking of what other word. I, I see where you're coming from with the question. I think that um, with flu shot, flu shot is some sort of vaccination, but the reason why it's flu shot is because every year we get to take it because there are different strains of flu and obviously to protect the kids, especially in school and ourselves, the creators of us that are health workers. So I guess it just the flu, don't get your flu shot, your annual flu shot. I don't really know much again about that, um, but for vaccine, I know that, you know, vaccination is, I don't think it's misleading. I think what it stands for is like 
come protect yourself against this virus. So if you're taking vaccines, it's uh, if you say immunization, uh, for lack of a better word, maybe that would be more um, welcoming or would we'll say, I really don't know what other word would be appropriate at this time, but I feel like, you know, the term vaccination isn't supposed to be scary when knowing fully well that this is something that's been used for a long time for other, um, you know, for other uh, diseases as well, like MMR, polio, with polio vaccination, it's MMR vaccination or, you know, and so I really don't think it's a misleading word. I just feel like for COVID-19, that's what it is. It's you get vaccine against that virus. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, you do have more questions in the chat, but I think there are some other questions um, that people have. So let's pause on the chat and then go to live. If you would unmute yourself, um, please speak up. Uh, this is Carl Peace. Uh, yes, sir. Co concerning uh, the discussion of the use of the word vaccination, I know many have uh, used the word inoculation instead of vaccination, but I think that's clearly unwise because you you are vaccinated in hopes to become inoculated. So just my uh, two cents worth. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Pease. <laughs> right. And I want to point out to as we um, in the uh, chat area, uh, Dr. Beck Foss has uh, provided the, the website for the vac vac uh, vaccine adverse event report system. So please take a look. Others, unmute yourself and speak up, please. Yeah, hello. Yes, hello. sir. How are you doing, sir? Yeah, yeah fine. My question is that. Uh, uh, Based on the vaccination now, you know, the flu shot, I guess anybody can take a flu shot, right? Mm -hmm. Even the kids. But now, presently now, with this vaccination, I know some kids too are exposed to COVID. But the problem is that what is the cure? What is the, what is the solution for the kids? If I cannot see a record where the kids have been vaccinated so far. So, okay, in your question? Yeah, there was a solution or the alternative for kids who are exposed to COVID. We they okay. also have access to vaccination, mm -hmm. unlike just they can take any flu shot at any time. But in this scenario now, it's very rare to see kids being vaccinated. Um, okay, so I think that um, the vaccination is going in phases and of course with different target population. What I have heard on recent is that they're trying to focus on educators now and I'm I'm my understanding is that you know they're looking at you know elementary school to I think teachers of elementary school to to, to middle school and high school I guess um, K two to twelve I'm not sure if I'm right but I heard that on on the news um, but for the kids I, I know that you know for those that are in school and my daughter is she goes to school she's currently in school right now it's more of preventive measures teachers are making sure they're washing their hands um, they're using their mask and all of that. Now, in terms of exposure to vaccine, um, to, to Corona or to the, to the virus, if it consistently and constantly, or I'll say over time, they have warned parents, if you find out that your child is sneezing, coughing and all of that, or showing any signs or signs of COVID-19, please keep them at home, you know, and uh, so that they don't come to school. And if they find out that they're doing that in school, they may have to call the parents to pick them up. I don't know when, um, how soon, the kids will get the vaccination. But if your concern is the reaction to the vaccine, I, I haven't, again, you know, I, we're all learning in this field. I haven't heard of any cases of reactions apart from what Dr. Samawi just mentioned. And of course, I think Dr. Chupak has been able to enlighten us more about why people are, might be having reactions, which might ultimately lead to, 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 to mortality. But for kids, I haven't heard of any cases of a child taking a vaccine and dying from it. Okay, thank you. So we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, I just have a, a, a comment from uh, the experience from Taiwan and about the vaccination. Back to 2009, there's H1N1 pandemic and Taiwan, yeah, purchased the, the vaccine. And it went smoothly because it's a vac mass vac uh, vaccination all people, you know, we are talking about millions of people. And when you, yeah, when, when something like this, the mass vaccination to millions of people, and we know that the, there are people die, people die every day. So when the two events so close to each other in time and they people grant the vaccine, yes, that must be wrong. So they, they have a community, I mean, from the 2009, 
there was one case, you know, a seven year old ch uh, a ch uh, child and died because uh, just right after the vaccination and uh, they get the flu shot, the H1N1. So, and the, the public, they just panic and the, the, the whole campaign stopped because of the, of the one case. But when you review, you know, there's a committee of experts to review each of those, you know, uh, bad effect because of the vaccine they report and very rare actually can be attributed to the vaccine. So as I, I just want to mention that the point, you know, when you, max, when you vaccinate millions of people and there are people dying every day, so, and people brand the vaccine, yeah. So when the, the, the two events so close to in each other. So I just want to mention that Okay. And Thank because you. the time is running out, so I will stop he talking. Thank you. Okay. All I right. Thank say, you, Dr. Tang. Dr. Tang, I wanted to say that, that uh, uh, I see. What, I think what um, what I'm getting from that is that there's really no you can't be you can't. There's no evidence base which has to show that there's a link between um, the deaths occurring at that time and the the, the the people who are taking the vaccines. And that could be also be the case because people have pre-existing conditions that can lead to you know that can also make them either react or even right. I've had COVID nineteen and as well die from that. The other thing I picked from that is herd immunity is very important. So for the question about the school, imagine if we had like seventy or eight to ninety percent of school students who take the vaccine, they have provided herd immunity for that. that that, that school community, or I'd say that school. So that could also uh, be something of, oh, 10% don't want to take it. Of course, we want them to, but we have 90% who have taken the vaccine, and then we, we can be sure of herd immunity in that, in that, you know, in that situation. Okay. Well, we want to thank you. Applause for you. Um, enthusiastic, high energy, extremely informative and you could just tell by the the long list of questions that that people were very engaged so so grateful thank you it was so wonderful to see you and we appreciate you taking the time because we know you have a lot going on um we still expect great things from you and you're definitely proving that so um thank you so much for your time and effort thanks everyone for being on the call in the future we we do have uh, more seminars coming. We hope that you pay attention to the calendar um, and, and you participate um, in those seminars um, and we will be bringing to you more informative persons like this. So thank you everyone for being on the call. Uh, a high thank appreciation. You. Thank you for Dr. Axenso um, for your work and we are so very proud um, you know, to, to just see you just grow and, and do so wonderful things. So thank you all and uh, please have a good rest of the day. And a reminder, um, if you can, we have a in about a minute. Uh, if you switch over um, to our invite our potential uh, person, um, we'll have that. So thank you all. See you later. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Have a nice one. Thank you, you so too. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you again. Okay. Take care yeah. of yourself. Yeah, we'll follow you. up with you, Dr. Akinso. Okay, okay. Thanks. All right. Bye. <laughs>